Um, a little prayer that they say in the Anglican Church came to mind, so I'll just say it before I start. May the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart be forever acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So, hello. We're carrying on in Philippians today, and I've already seen quite a lot of what's in this passage come out in worship and in prayers, so that's always good. So I'm going to start by reading the passage, which is Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 16, and uh, we're in the ESV version. Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward goal of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So you might remember that uh, in January, I shared one week that I felt that God has given me a, verse, a couple of verses for this year, and they are verse 13 and 14 from this passage. They say, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. These verses, I love what they convey about throwing off the past and all distractions and setting your eyes on what it is all about and remembering that for us as Christians, the best is yet to come. It's always yet to come. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, but as I looked at this passage as a whole a little bit more, I don't know about you, but I found it quite hard to get my head around completely. I took quite a bit of time getting this passage straight in my head, and I'll now try to share some of what I found with you. So we'll begin with the beginning of the passage, which says, not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. So straight away, we have to look at it before in order to get an idea of what Paul is talking about when he's referring to the this and the it that Paul hasn't yet fully obtained. In the previous passage that uh, Charles spoke on last week, Paul wrote, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of the resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, Tom Wright, who we're reading his commentaries as we go, he explains that this thing that Paul hasn't yet obtained, that he possession of yet, is the resurrection of the dead. Because that, of course, still was in Paul's future, and it's actually in all of our futures. It's not just heaven that we're aiming at, you know, as in where we go when we die, but both our life on earth and our continuing spiritual life in heaven are spent in anticipation of Jesus coming again and the dawn of the new heaven and the new earth. Heaven and earth restored to their original purpose. That is our real home, and that's what we really crave. Right, also, also talks about the fact that Paul is making it clear that he does not feel that he has arrived as a Christian in his earthly life either. It's not that we become a Christian and that's it until we die or until Jesus comes back. 
Paul talks about not yet being made perfect. And what can that mean? But that there is more progress to be won on this side of heaven. I also got into reading quite a lot of Alexander McLaren. So I hadn't heard of him before, but he was a Scottish Baptist minister born in 1826. And he has biblical insights by the bucket loads. Amazing. Um, he suggests that when Paul is talking about having not yet obtained this thing, that he hasn't got possession of this thing yet, that Paul is also referring to the other things which he talked about in that last passage, when he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So Paul, he obviously already knows Jesus and he, the power of his resurrection is already working in his life. And he's sharing in Christ's sufferings already, but that's not the end of it. These are not things that once experienced once, once done once, can be ticked off the list. Paul expects that we will advance in these areas when we can. There's a reference in McLaren's exposition to Psalm 84, and it actually ties in with the devotional thing I'm following at the moment. Um, and I don't think there's many other passages more fitting than verses five to seven in this psalm to describe the life of a believer. It says this. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also come. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. We are a people who are on a journey, our whole lives through, and we only have one destination before us. So according to McLeod, I think it does seem that there are five things that Paul feels he hasn't fully obtained yet. The first being to know Jesus. Now, Paul knows Jesus. You know, we know this from how he writes, you know, in verse eight in that previous passage, he says, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And we know it too, because we read about um, when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and Jesus really clearly made himself known to Paul with a blinding light and audible commands and identifying himself to him. But there is so much to know about Jesus that we can never say we fully know him this side of eternity. It takes a lifetime to fully get to know a spouse or a friend or a family member. And Jesus is far more profound than that. He's more consistent, true and good, but he's far, far bigger than we can hope to comprehend right now. The lovely thing is, he does let us learn about him, though, step by step. And he really loves it when we do that. And he deserves the glory that comes with that. As we know him more, we love him more, and we glorify him more. And it does us so much good as well. The second thing that he has not fully obtained, Paul fully, hasn't fully obtained yet, is to know the power of Christ's resurrection. And this is the power that Jesus' death and rising to life again has released for us as believers. After his resurrection, that's when the Holy Spirit came and he brought new life to us and new power to change our hearts, to change our minds, to change our circumstances and even the circumstances of those around us. Again, Paul had experienced this, but there was more to be experienced. And we've experienced this. If we've accepted him into our lives, then we have the Holy Spirit. That's already a miracle. And there will have been times that we can point to in our lives when things have not gone as they should have, should have <laughs> because his power has been at work. Even in just the way we've reacted to something at some point or a near miss that we were saved from. But again, there is for us. We have the same power at work in us that raised Jesus from the dead. 
So we ain't seen nothing yet. The third thing that Paul does, hasn't fully realized yet is to share in Jesus' sufferings. Now, Paul had already had what most of us would have thought was more than, but there was more of this to come for him too. And again, the same is true for us. I think reading Philippians has been pretty humbling for me. I think it's becoming clearer to me that the message of the Bible of Jesus again and again is that in order to go higher, we must first go lower. That the sufferings we face, instead of being a sign that we've got it wrong, of course, though there are sometimes consequences of our actions, but a lot of the time, they're, they're more often signs that we're going in the right direction. As it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 11, yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you be sober-minded be watchful your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour resist him firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world and after you have suffered a little while the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The suffering we face can be due to opposition, as we stand by our faith and its values, from other people or from the enemy. But Jesus also faced another kind of suffering, and I felt this is coming clearer to me recently, and, I, and uh, McLaren really put his finger on it. I think we see this kind of suffering when Jesus expresses pain in reaction to see the people of God going astray and the state of the world around him. There's so much joy in our faith. There is. There is a strength and a light that can carry us through the darkest night. But in another way, I feel like maybe as we see his light more fully, the darker the world looks by comparison. And the more the suffering of the world affects us. It's just not what we were made for. And it's not what anyone was made for. And that's why it hurts. And finally, there's the him in his death and attaining the resurrection of the dead. These were, of course, ahead of Paul. Things firmly set in the future and therefore obviously not yet obtained. But Paul was certain that these lay ahead of him, and he didn't shy away from the idea of becoming like Jesus in his death. He saw it as a reasonable way to get to the resurrection of the dead. It was good enough for Jesus, after all. And the resurrection of the dead was Paul's chief aim, as he goes on to explain. I think it's really quite encouraging to hear, to, well, to read Paul speaking like this. Because sometimes people can get a bit intimidated by Paul, you know, what, when he talks about what we have already received and how therefore we should be living. But it's helpful to hear him say that he was not yet fully got there and that he was not yet perfect. In fact, in verse 15 of this passage, he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. What he is saying here is that the mature in the faith, and that word mature, it just means fully grown, should realize that they're not yet perfect, that they have still a way to go. And he says that if they don't realize this, then God will reveal it to them if they're mature. It reminded me of John chapter 7, verse 17, when Jesus says, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. I find it really encouraging to think that when we're truly seeking Jesus, when we're truly seeking truth and his way, then he will help us to find him and he'll help us to find the truth. It's really, really important that we remember that God is on our side when we're trying to find him. No one cares for the sheep who've gone astray like him. We love because he first loved us. As Paul says in verse 12, I press on to make it my own. 
because Christ Jesus has made me his own. When we to grow, when we press on to lay hold of all he has for us, it's because he first lay hold of us. And we have gained Christ and we are found in him. We are then to live out the rest of our lives in the light of that and in the resurrection to come. For one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Now, the language in this passage, there's no denying it's really active. It's all about laying hold of things and straining on. It's the imagery of that race, which we get quite a lot in Paul's writing. And I thought it was quite good the way Tom Wright explains it. You know, how he talks about it. He gives this illustration. The athletes were bunched together as they came to the end, and one of them was pushed over and fell right off the track. Quick as a flash, he was back on his feet, and as though electrically charged by the incident, caught the other go and overtook them to win on the line. It was a famous victory, which features now in the movies in the movie Chariots of Fire. What would you have done? Most of us, I suspect, would have accepted from the moment we fell over that we were out of the race, with no hope left. We might have been angry, but there would be nothing we could do about it. What had in fact just happened would keep us enslaved with no hope of going on to what might have happened. With the athlete in question, the famous Eric Liddell, it was just the opposite. It was as though he had been reading this passage of Paul, forget what's behind, strain every nerve to go after what's ahead, and chase on toward the finishing post. So we'll leave behind. It might be different for different people. It might be that the thing we need to let go of is how we think we've been doing in our race so far. It might be, like Paul, the things that we need to leave behind are the things that we used to think were important, now realize are worth nothing. Or it may be that we need to leave behind some difficult times that we've been going through. Whatever they are, we cannot let them steal our attention from our goal, from that prize that is ahead of us. What a wonderful end we know that we have. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul also writes about the prize. He says, and now the prize awaits a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. All who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Again, the goal isn't heaven, but resurrection. It's appearing when all will be made right. Now, sometimes when David reads a book, um, he skips to the end to find out how it ends so that he knows it's, if it's worth getting through the really scary bits. <laughs> and I think that, and I say you should read it in order because that's how the author wants you to. But it's a bit different in our story. We have this privilege already. We know the end and it's the best end. It's more than good enough to encourage us to get through the sticky bits in our lives and the author has given us clues but he tells us what happens at the end in fact i believe that when we look at the whole of our lives through the eyes of eternity it no longer looks like this nice path which sometimes episodes i think it's all part of the journey psalm 23 never says that the darkest valley is a mistaken detour it says he'll be with us to guide us through it, just as he guides us through green pastures and beside still waters. Again, if it's good enough for Jesus. And of course, God does show us his love for us when he leads us by in these green pastures and when he leads us beside these still waters. They're wonderful times. But he really starts treating us as sons in whom he is well pleased when he through the dark valleys. 
there is a passage in Hebrews that I can never fully grasp. It says in chapter 5, verses 7 to 10, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. It said that Jesus was made perfect through suffering. And if Jesus as was to be perfected, that must certainly be true of us. And if the path he trod was hard, then we can hardly be surprised when it was true for us. But equally, his life blessed others abundantly, and his end was glorious. And the same will also be true for us. It says in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. That's us. Conformed into the image of his son. We are called. We are justified. We're glorified. To take in. But we have got this lifetime and the next lifetime to do just that. We just take it step by step. But as Paul closes the passage, only let us hold true to what we have attained. We are called to live out what we have attained, where we have already arrived. It's important to remember that that is going to be different for each one of us. We're all on the same journey, but we are on different paths of, parts of the path, and that is totally fine. But as we live out our faith, it will grow. When you lean on it, you'll see its strength. We just need to keep it up and keep our hearts set on pilgrimage and our eyes on the final prize. I'm going to finish with a prayer. Lord, thank you that we are counted among your people. Thank you that we know the end of the story. Lord, I thank you that you know exactly what you're doing. And thank you that you make us like your son. Thank you that you deserve the glory. And everything, you, and everything is going back to you. Lord, lead us in your ways. And help us to bless those around us as we go and shine your light in those dark places. Lord, when life seems dark, that we know the light. Help us to radiate you, Lord, and share you.